Leon Theremin. Now, you know that name, right? The Beach Boys, that, that instrument. He's very well known for that globe-like instrument used in the Beach Boys songs. But another invention that he had that would get to the United States was not as innocent. It was called in the U.S. The Thing, also known as the Great Seal Bug. It was initially just a gift given by the Soviet Union to Ambassador Avril Harriman on August 4th, 1945. And maybe one shouldn't accept such a gift, but it seemed pretty innocent and It was very well crafted. The seal, the eagle just had this really large, well-carved beak. Well, the beak, as it turned out, was a listening device. But it didn't make sense that there would be anything but an innocent gift here. There was no electric at all on this thing. If there was something that was running on batteries, they would have died out. As it turned out, this is a very early version of RFID. The device was called a passive cavity resonator, and it became active only when a radio signal of the correct frequency was sent to the device from an external transmitter. Uh, It's called in NSA parlance as illuminating a passive device. Now it's well known, was not known that if you're from one of those states that has your, you have your car and you have the kind of easy pass thing that you're going to pass through the token boost on, you're going to know that that's an RFID. In other words, there's no battery in there. It's getting its power from the radio waves. The United States had no idea something like this existed. They didn't know a device was possible. It was used by the Soviets to spy in the United States. And it was hung on the Moscow residential study for seven years. They're not quite sure if it was the beak or if the beak was just where, you know, it, would, it, was, it was deeper in. Sound waves from voices inside the ambassador office pass through the thin wood case, strike the membrane and cause it to vibrate. The moment the membrane varied the capacitance seen by the antenna, which in turn modulated the radio waves that struck and were retransmitted by the thing, the receiver demodulated the signal so that sound picked up by the microphone could be heard, just as ordinary radio receiver demodulates radio signals and outputs sound. You don't need to know any of that except that it was a way of transmitting radio signals without having any power. Theremin's design made the listening device very difficult to detect because it was small, no power supply. It does not radiate a signal unless it was actively being irradiated remotely. The existence of the bug was discovered accidentally by a British radio operator at the British Embassy who overheard American conversations on an open radio channel just as the Soviets were beaming radio waves at the ambassador's office. An American State Department employee then figured out State Department employees with some experience in this were sent to investigate it and other suspected bugs. They conducted technical surveillance countermeasures, a sweep of the ambassador's office using a signal generator and a receiver in a setup that generates audio feedback. How? If the sound from the room transmitted on a given frequency. During the sweep, they found the device in the Great Seal carving. The Federal Bureau of Investigation set about to analyze the device and hired people from the British Marconi Company to help with the analysis. The examination of the thing, of the seal bug, led to the development of a similar British system, codenamed Satyr, used throughout the 50s by the British, the Americans, Canadians, the Australians. The CIA ran a secret research program at the Dutch Radar Laboratory from 1954 to 1967 to create its own covert listening devices. In addition to learning something from being fooled, it was also useful in diplomacy. In May 1960, the thing was mentioned on the fourth day of meetings 
in the United Nations Security Council convened by the Soviet Union over the 1960 U-2 incident where a U.S. spy planet entered their territory and was shot down. We denied it. They produced the pilot. The U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. showed off the bugging device in the Great Seal to illustrate that spying incidents between the two nations were mutual and to allege that Nikita Khrushchev had magnified this particular incident as a pretext to abort the 1960 Paris summit. All of this is to let you know that the Soviet Union, which Russia, whose government and almost everything with it, Russia would inherit, was very interested in listening. An instrumental part of speech recognition was in Leningrad, the Scientific Research Institute of Delsias. Offices of applied acoustic units were always guarded by men with automatic weapons. This was not something they took lightly. They had roughly 10,000 employees there. And the real purpose was to work for the military. The applied acoustics unit of 300 was run by the KGB. And it was so important to them that they very rare in the Soviet Union, paid bonuses. Where the Soviet Union was computer starved, thanks to generous funding from the KGB, in the early 1980s, a section of the unit received personal computers, even few IBM PS2s. Mikhail Kitrov and five of his colleagues had so much technology knowledge, they were able to found a private company that in 1993 became the Speech Technology Center trademarked in the U.S. as Speech Pro. It continues into the after the fall of the Soviet Union. The FSB, who inherited the KGB apparatus, offers a contract to make a system that would separate voice from background noise. In 2008, the company completed its first national voice recognition project in Mexico. Sergey Koval began a work on acoustics in 1973. In 2012, Koval got investment from a source close to Putin. It's in September 2011, Gazprom Bank acquired 35% of Speech Pro. There are some elections that people just can't stop talking about. Countless books, articles, scholarly papers have been written about the 1968 election. I've even talked about that. The 1876 election gets a lot of discussion. The 1948 election gets a lot of discussion. These are various responses from the website Quora um, that people have when asked uh, what went wrong with the 2016 elections and what they felt about Russia in the 2016 election. The media's choice of the term hacked in reference to the election is itself bombastic problem. Russian-sponsored media no favored Trump is in this day and helps Russia Britain make an age. It is inconceivable that Putin's Russia attempted to interfere in the U.S. election. Except that, I don't think that Putin's Russia is truly of this day and age who actually does stuff like this. He grabbed two bits of Georgia because he wanted them. He grabbed the Crimea because he wanted a sarcastic suggestion when this idea for service that if the Russians had hacked into Clinton's email, they might also be able to find the 30,000 missing emails she erased. turned by President Obama to deliberately false quote, okay. which claimed, how did Russia interfere with the U.S. election? Hack propaganda war the Russians didn't need to hack the vote machines. They got to you before they even walked to the booth. And I know you want the outcome that it wanted, thereby undermining the foundation. When you see something in your feed and go, did Russia hack organizations? In the Senate hearing, on January 5th, 2017, Director Clapper said there's no evidence that one vote was changed. The 
Ukraine's Russian trolls were very active on social media trying to influence voting, specifically because of dangerous war-mongering establishment fusion. Their investigations pending to try to find evidence more Jill Stein votes which meant a higher percentage of Trump. Yes, the indictment of the Russian company Internet Research Agency Since and Russia various no Russian national treaties for the promise and most of the indictment of the operation is here simply have not bothered to respond. Solid enough to stand before a grand jury. One thing is clear almost by all reasonable sources. There was some attempt, there was an interference campaign on the part of the Russians. The Obama administration warned Americans repeatedly of Russian interference in the months and weeks leading up to the November 2016 election. At first, specifics were not really given, and then it was confirmed with a report of intelligence agencies that a disinformation campaign, desinformatia, desa, well known in Russia. Active measures, Kompromat, Deza, were not as well known to most Americans. These active measures or influence campaigns refer to specific actions of political warfare. Specifics such as fake Facebook accounts, fake YouTube accounts, fake Twitter accounts, fake memes, troll farms, thousands of Twitter bots. Russian Roulette, the inside story of Putin's war in America and the election of Donald Trump by Michael Isakoff and David Korn was released, just missed the February indictments of Internet Research Agency, the Russian troll farm that spread propaganda in 2016. American National Security in an Age of Lies by Michael Hayden, a retired Air Force general who directed both the NSA and the CIA. In there, Hayden says, we seem to lack the vision to fully understand what the Russians were up to with their more full spectrum information dominance. From Cold War to Hot Peace, Michael McFall, former ambassador to Russia. In there, he explains that the objective of Russian efforts in the US media was not only to support Donald Trump, but to undermine the truth more generally. Indeed, the Russians have asked to be able to speak with Michael McFall. None of this should be as surprising as we think. Uh, for generations, Soviet and Russian authorities have undermined truth Pose contradictory realities, denied common knowledge until people no longer knew it for sure. And I have a notebook full of, and a notepad on computer full of stuff, and this unfinished Soviet Union cast, and it's still not in a form where it can really be released, but I'll be exerting. Uh, I remember uh, being detained in the Atlanta airport. Um, thankfully, I was on a first class seat. Uh, but uh, and spending four hours on a runway and I was literally spending that time transferring notes from one notebook to another and kind of refining and adding new things in and since then I've added even more one of the things that I picked up on in that you know in in the Soviet Union radio signals were jammed there was a lot of propaganda they were also receiving in some cases propaganda from the West as well it depending on where you lived and so it was hard to believe and people sort of became experts at reading between the lines, but another skill that you develop is just not to believe anything that anyone's saying, which maybe isn't the right way either. And some of this is purposeful, as you see here, that if you're creating lies upon lies and distortions, people are just gonna kind of turn off and stop seeking truth. I see that a lot in this entire issue of Russia, the 2016 election, of the investigations between the Trump campaign and involvement with Russia, the arrest and indictment and now plea bargain of uh, Paul Manafort, uh, the other campaign aides. There's still Americans who are like, well, I don't really want to know anymore about this. It's too confusing. All of the books that we talked about previously uh, are from 2017, 2018, and they're by Americans. 
And there could be bias. So for instance, you know, Hayden's not partisan, but he does appear on MSNBC and he's over time gotten pretty angry uh, with the president. Um, and he's not the first person who's either nonpartisan or GOP to do so. Michael McFaul, uh, the former ambassador to Russia, served in the Obama administration. So you know, maybe he didn't want Trump to win. You could say that. But I always like to go back to books because, you know, the past becomes the ultimate truth in a sense because the people writing in the past can't know the future and can't be biased by events in the future. So it's almost like, you know, ultimate truth. There was a book released in 2015 that spoke about specifics in information warfare, and it's called The Red Web, The Struggle Between Russia's Digital Dictators and the New Online Revolutionaries. It's written by two Russian journalists who were born and raised and live in Moscow, Andrei Soldatov and Irina Borogan. They're Russian journalists whose work has been featured in the New York Times, the Moscow Times, Washington Post, Le Monde, CNN, BBC, and the Online Journalism Review. Um, and um, I'll read some sections of this book. I found it extremely interesting. I believe you should, you know, rather than just relying on this cast, I'm not an expert in Russian politics, though I dabble a bit. I had the interview with Michael Zagar. Um, I, I had an interview with Mikhail Zagar last year. And in this episode, I must give credit to my wife, Robin, for doing research on this important topic. Um, but the greatest favor you can do for her or for me is to go and purchase the, the Red Web and, and read that book. I think it's very interesting. Irina, one of the co-writers of the Red Web, shares memories of Perestroika when she was a young woman. It was possible to voice personal opinions then, to have discussions about politics. Perestroika is seen as something that Gorbachev had a meeting and introduced, right? And it's, it is kind of true that it, that is what happened. It was a kind of top-down change. But like so many things in history, either in, the, in Russia or the United States, there's more to that as well. Um, that change comes out of a popular movement, and particularly after the Chernobyl incident, and a massive reaction to both the incompetence and the closed-mindedness, the, the useless bureaucracy and the repression that led to that nuclear disaster and so many lives lost. It was the closest, and there'd be several more leading up to the fall of the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union had to having a popular uprising. Uh, you just didn't do that there. But that was a moment, and Gorbachev seized on that moment and then introduced the perestroika change. And the change was real. It could be overstated, but it was real. Uh, as this author says, it was possible to voice personal opinions, to have discussions about politics. The mood changed everywhere on the bus, the train, the metro, People were just talking openly and freely about everything. They were talking about Western movies, books, music that were prohibited. And these are now flowing into the country. Glasnost means openness, transparency. It wasn't until 1995, after the fall of the Soviet Union, that Russia really establishes modern national communications. Phone development, because of the paranoia surrounding it, was so poorly developed. And even if you had a phone, try to get your hands on a phone book. After the fall of the Soviet Union, which results, this is this is this would be a whole podcast in itself. Uh, and and I do if I ever release my Soviet Union podcast, we'll get to it um, and tell that story. But I think there's a couple of interesting things to know. The fall of the Soviet Union occurs after a failed coup. And you can't state enough that the leader of the coup was a man that Gorbachev had promoted, a hardliner, that he thought he was as a, as a favor to the hardliners, as a way of zigzagging between left and right and keeping his position. Gorbachev made him head of the KGB. That guy is the leader of the coup. 
Now, he didn't have total support in the organization or else it would have it would have succeeded. In 1995, the KGB was renamed FSB. The FSB was to be investigative, both secret services and law enforcement all in one. The SVR would become the new espionage agency. It's important to go up to the city that was Leningrad, was allowed in 1990 to be renamed. And the residents overwhelmingly went back to the, not the Soviet name, but the old name of St. Petersburg. Of all the cities in the Soviet Union that was still retained in the architecture, in the art, in the intellectualness of that city, they're still the most European city in Russia, one might say. The buildings reflect that, and it has a port that's open in the Baltic. Residents there immediately wanted to change back to St. Petersburg, and they elected a mayor, Mayor Sobchak. Now, Sobchak was a civilian. He was a kind of a populist. He had the pulse of the people. He knew how to, he got himself. They allowed a free election for mayor of the city, and he was elected. He appoints a person to be head of security and then, or vice mayor, you might say, of St. Petersburg named Vladimir Putin. The famous story is that Vladimir Putin decided that uh, he wanted to study in the university. Putin had been an agent in eastern Germany, and he wanted to, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, to study a little bit more and to study the foreign relations. And so he attends what was then Leningrad University. Um there's a lot of ways this this can go. Um, technically, Vladimir Putin then was, retired would be the wrong word, technically not an active KGB agent. He's a university student. That's not very innocent, right? <laughs> um, the reality is most likely that, um, uh, most likely that, that he was one of many, many deactivated persons that always remained part of the KGB. The saying was, once a spy, always a spy. The KGB maintained a large active reserve. One Gorbachev employee, as he's trying to reform things, says they're intractable. These KGB people are part of every government office. And it's just this large network. The thing was, it always wasn't always that secret. Um, people knew if they worked in an office, like who the KGB guy was. Mayor Sobchak famously saw Putin in the hallway, you know, and they chatted it up and maybe he had known him from uh, somewhere else and chatted it up and, and uh, he asked him to become his vice mayor. You know, anyone who knows the operation of the Soviet Union at the time, what the KGB was doing, really looks at this story I mean, you know, for this account, I'm um, using uh, Masha Gensen's Man Without a Face, which, which talks a lot about the rise of Vladimir Putin. He shouldn't just be seen as a Russian leader, but also as a direct connection to the old world, Soviet world. Outside of a few years at the mayor's office, and that's a suspect as a career in democracy, whether he was a, a real Democrat is, is questioned. He spent his time in security services and was KGB and then FSB. I mean, it's important to know that Putin was outside Russia during perestroika. And so all of these great changes, when people are voicing their opinions going on in Moscow, he's in East Germany. And that's up until the fall of the Berlin Wall, one of the most severe security states in the Warsaw Pact. Putin was in the KGB when it crushed dissidents, hunted for Samizdat publications, Cracked down on international phone lines after the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. East Germany is probably the most repressive of all the Warsaw Pact nations with the most developed intelligence services and security forces next to the Russia and the Soviet Union itself. Um, the fact that the Berlin, Berlin Wall moment happened belies what the leadership of East Germany wanted to happen. The Honecker, the, the East German leaders up until the day that that wall fell, felt that they were being betrayed by Gorbachev. That was, they, they had no part whatsoever 
in Perestroika, in fact, saw it to the to the last minute. Highly suspicious of Gorbachev and what he was doing, thought that Gorbachev was an agent of Reagan and that they were being sold out. The government that he was an agent in was a considerably autocratic and uh, well-controlled society up until the point that it wasn't, and then it very quickly changed. I think it's worth talking about the day of the coup. So while Gorbachev's having a rough day under house arrest uh, from his vacation home, uh, and everyone throughout the Soviet Union is figuring out what to do, the KGB either messes up or it appears that maybe a few of the local KGB guys didn't want to do it. They don't pick up Boris Yeltsin at his dacha outside of Moscow. Yeltsin isn't arrested. He goes to the Russian White House. First, he goes to the Kremlin, knocks on the door. I mean, this is a pretty, you got to give him credit for bravery. Uh, no one wants to talk to him from the, the coup leaders. So they're confused. They have a lousy press conference. It's a series of events that definitely will turn out in Yeltsin's favor as he goes to the White House and stands on the tank, etc. In St. Petersburg, the other large city, in the Soviet Union, there are protests at all the factories. There's protests in the streets. They're telling that, you know, the mayor is out visiting factories and telling them to not to cooperate with the coup leaders. Initially, the story that comes out is that Putin, as the vice mayor, is along with him by his side. But it's pretty clear now that Putin was just at one of the factories and in a bunker, kind of in a form of hiding and waiting to see what would happen. What is known is that. Putin, though ostensibly he's no longer working for the KGB, reports to his boss, the head of the KGB. Ignore history and you lose an eye. Forget history and you lose two eyes. So goes the Russian proverb. The much-feared KGB was an omnipotent part of life in the Soviet Union. But that doesn't mean that there is agents to follow every person, or that the KGB saw everything, or that it never failed. Some activities were in KGB attention, such as dissident behavior, talking to people who were dissidents or ostracized, being found with the Sazimat materials, um, studying a foreign language, not one of the Warsaw Nation languages. Certainly, if one was of Jewish nationality, that was already a bit of a flag that could lead to discrimination, but also increased surveillance. And something like wanting to study Hebrew or espousing views supportive of Israel or Zionists. All of these things could get you surveilled might have you called in to a KGB office or some kind of police or militia office for questioning. In 1991, the KGB remained well supported by an intense network. The American equivalent of boardrooms, you know, golf games, the kind of people networks and party committees that were locked in with the army and government. Gorbachev intended to bring in this KGB group a little bit more aligned with Perestroika, but he was having trouble and never made as much headway as the reformers wanted. KGB was exempted from major provisions of perestroika, and Gorbachev defended them on several occasions from reformers. A few staff shakeups was all, was all the KGB would get, while other areas of Soviet life were fundamentally changed. Indeed, to suppress elements that might completely topple things, Gorbachev needed the KGB. They, for instance, played a critical role in resisting the revolution under Gorbachev's watch in Lithuania before the fall of the, of the Soviet Union. It turned out to be a critical strategic era, almost a deadly one for Gorbachev, as the KGB led the coup against him, the leader of the KGB did. We should think of the Soviet Union as a military society, and doing that adds a level of understanding to the things that go on even if we don't agree with it. it. Leads us to understand who they were and what they were doing. It was a society on heightened alert, a society at war with enemies declared or not. We know World War II. That's what we call that war. For them, it was the war or the great patriotic war. Russians felt it. They fought in it and they Americans, in their perception, just helped. 
Soviet Union, Soviet citizens lost giant heart-wrenching numbers. There were many more females in the Soviet Union and older females in the 60s, 70s, and 80s because a male generation had been almost wiped out with the Great Patriotic War. Heart-wrenching numbers. 20 millions of people died. It's known in the United States as a stat in a textbook, but it's not that kind of double known, that kind of real known. The nation was invaded, which never happened to the U.S. in World War II. All right, you know, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, the base there. But their land was invaded. Capitals threatened. Large populations of their nation were under German control. Yes, Stalin was ineffective, evil, not always popular. He botched the invasion defense. He did nothing while Russia lost the Ukraine, the breadbasket. Without him and then with him, the nation rallied. Only World War II forged what Soviet Union was and some inkling of what Russia is today. Cementing farmers, workers, party members, even the destroyed Orthodox Church was revived as an important patriotic organ during the war and survived through the fall of the Soviet Union. Lots of statues and military equipment old rocket launchers, armored vehicles from World War II, the vehicle itself being the monument. And yes, you may see a bride and groom posing next to that military equipment, taking pictures next to tanks or rocket launchers. Oh yes, don't get carried away. They still took photos in the traditional scenic places, lakes and forests and all, but the best photo for a wedding, the photo the couple just had to take, was next to a lovely green tank a symbol of the patriotic struggle. After that, well, a visit to the Palace of Weddings, the name implying the role of government which was ever present in life. Palace of Weddings. After which, through many a Russian street, many a toast to the bride. Oh, you'd better just do that. Not doing it would be like stepping on the American flag. Then after a dirty look, after you did what you were supposed to do, a dirty look from the groom, Toast the bride. You would carefully switch gears and offer a second toast to all the women of the Soviet Union. And your tension with the hulky groom momentarily mitigated. You would switch as they snapped photos of the bride and groom in front of a rocket launcher, a tank, a transport carrier. Who cares? It's still so romantic. The thought of kicking German butt to start your happy day. Artifacts of the Great Patriotic War line the cities and parks. The most common movies and TV over and over again in the Soviet Union were movies about the Soviets taking on the Nazis. An old man in the streets in 1983 in a nation where old men were somewhat rare would walk in his uniform, walk down the street with full medals and no one would think he was some crazy man. No one would think it was strange 40 years later to be walking with his uniform on. The United States was of Athens and we were of Sparta, said one Russian to the author Hendrik Smith. The USSR was a military nation, prideful of being the nation that truly beat Hitler. And you need to know that to understand it. And then you can understand the transition to Russia because as we're going to talk about, to some extent, the person leading the country comes from this era and not from ours. As the 1980s dawned, the once repressed professions of sociology, economics became more popular. All of the intellectual research that was fed into uh, by the military that was incentivized by the need to be keep up with the United States on a military level. And it did have a side effect that Russia was becoming an extremely scientific country, an intellectual country. There are a lot of people in these professions. They didn't turn their thinking caps off all the time after the military contract work was done. Um, their ranks were more plentiful as the government tried to examine the population better. So you're starting to see late 70s, early 80s, an interest in sociology. Like, what are we doing here? And, and asking some questions. This was banned, certainly, this would have gotten you killed during the Stalin era. 
examining society like a science, and it was frowned upon in the 60s. But as you reach the 70s and 80s, most foremost of these, uh, Tatiana Zaslev, well-read sociologist within the Soviet Union, was writing and saying that the rigid education system and ambitionless, ambitionless work life, the command and control of bureaucracy, might not all be a good thing. It was leading to a population that could not grow in industry or adapt to changes of modern life. It created what she said was an obedient and passive labor force. Men who behaved like machines, they ran. Not men, but cogs. And then the rebellion was coming in the form of absenteeism, slacking, shirking, stealing a few products from the assembly for home use or to sell privately. In the absence of a gulag level of oppression that you might have seen in the 50s, early 60s, fear of being shot, say, you're just cheating the system. Many workers, lots of people, maybe the whole country, in some form, cheating the rest of the country. Everyone was getting a little over on the nation, one Soviet citizen said. I don't know how this nation got Sputnik up. I think it was aliens, another said after his plans for a new industrial plant had to be revised by several layers of naysaying. A new auto plant built for the Soviets by Italian car makers, the best in the world in the nation, soon suffered from a lack of parts, and it lost key equipment to theft. It would never be the model it was intended to be. Is it fair for workers to get money without producing everything? Gorbachev would lecture as he introduced his market reforms. A lot of the population would agree it was not fair. Workers were getting off a bit, that's true. But in their second role, as consumers, those same workers were suffering. Baby bottles, eyeglasses, typewriters, all necessary items, seemingly commonplace in the West, were very hard to find in the Soviet Union. A phone, a telephone, was a big deal. Here's what one person said. I was born in Kazan in 1978, upper middle class because my grandfather worked as a bookkeeper in the capital of Tartazan province. Having my own jeans in, college, in childhood was cool. Having a phone inside the apartment was really cool. Many neighbors regularly came to us for making an urgent call when needed. This is in the 1980s. You got neighbors coming to use the phone. And we had a big library of books. It was an attribute of social status. Most Russian apartments had hardwood floors, for not for style, like we might do, but because carpets were another item that was very hard to get. Laundry soap was scarce at times. And then at other times, production would scale and there would be a glut. These comments that I'm telling you now are coming from the website Quora, from other internet forums, from people who actually lived in the Soviet Union describing what it was like. And they have some differing opinions, but there's some areas of consensus. Food would consume a good portion of a Soviet citizen's pay as housing and healthcare were cheap. Milk, butter, and scrawny chickens that you might get were pricey. Some would say Russians were doing well in the 1980s from where they came though. A grandmother would marvel at how in the post-World War II days, her family of 11 share an apartment. Now, the grandsons were supplied with their own room. It wasn't always that easy, though. In the 1980s, there were waiting queues for good housing and divorces and children complicated housing situations in a way the governing authorities couldn't keep up with. The nation in the 1980s fed its citizens on 3,300 calories a day average. That's about as much as France at that time and more than a dieting American should eat, perhaps. But this was no Atkins diet that the Soviet Union offered. It was heavy on starch. Still, it was comparably better than many countries in the third world. Two thirds of Russian houses had a washing machine, saving time, though other items, even in the late 1970s or 80s, were scarce. A quarter of households had vacuums, same for color TVs. But TV wasn't the same anyway. There was no rich American programming and cable channels, you know. You talked, you invited friends over, you listened to music. 
There are counter arguments. I've heard people who had lived there saying that compared to the United States, meat tasted like meat, no pink slime. What passes for cake in the USA is absurd and I find them inedible. Go to a Russian bakery and see what cake should taste like. Ice cream. I mean, seriously, guys, the word right there says it should be made from cream, not water like in the United States. Food. We've always eaten food from what in the U.S. is called a farmer's market. It looked normal, natural, and was seasonal. It tasted real. I don't remember the in infamous food lines in Odessa, except early morning lines for warm, fresh bread. U.S. supermarkets puzzle me with their perennial fruit and vegetables that out of season all tasted the same. There's a lot of variance between those opinions. That guy's in Odessa, or was in Odessa. Uh, there are other people in Moscow who had a lot of trouble, a lot of tr um, train trips to get needed food, and particularly things like pharmaceutical and health and beauty aids. While the food progress of the Soviet Union could be debatable, there was no debating the nation's prowess in communications. During the Cold War, Secret services wanted all information, including communications between people under their control. They rigidly controlled public space, newspapers, TV, that's all under censorship. The program acronym would be called SORM. SORM stands for System of Operative Search Measures. That means the Soviet Union was spying on all communications. SORM 1, the first generation of SORM, the KGB would tap phones. Many of us have seen movies with the Cold War villains in a separate room with the reel-to-reel -reel tapes, with men in headphones, listening to phone conversations. That was real, that happened, they devoted employees to the task, a lot of resources devoted to intelligence. It's with the use of the internet, SORM doesn't go away. The desire to spy doesn't go away just because telephones being replaced somewhat by internet. There's SORM 2, which covers 1990s internet, which covers mobile calls when that starts happening, and SORM 3, which covers all telecommunications. Just as the KGB had the ability to record, intercept any phone call for decades, they wanted the same control over the internet. All Russian operators and ISPs were required to install black boxes about the size of an old videotape recorder, which permits connection to the regional departments of the FSB. No one oversees what the FSB is doing with this, just like no one really oversaw the KGB very much. If you're of a certain age, you have memories of the Cold War and the villains in many movies were Russian. You also know the Russians had much less freedom than Americans, and you may have heard of the black market. Black market, the way of getting a book or recording from someone. They weren't available in any store in Russia. You may have also heard of the demand for blue jeans. But there are a few things that you have not heard likely about the Cold War. That there were things like Gus Gomidat, censored fiction and censored poetry that had to be passed on. The Xerox machines, copiers were scarce. Uh, even writing materials uh, could, be, could be difficult. And these books, some of them earned a lot of fame as they would spread across the Soviet Union to become popular. But it's likely that you got to read them only for a short period and then passed it on to someone else. You know, at different times in the Soviet Union's history, there was in Moscow certain book markets. And sometimes authorities would look the other way. But of course, you know, you never know who was watching who in that system. Uh, local police, uh, militia might be looking the other way at the book, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, spontaneous book market that might start up in the grass. But if you were someone that frequented a lot, that might pick up a flag to understand the Soviet Union, which again is going to really be what the country of Russia inherits, that apparatus. Soviet Union was not an occupying regime. Instead, the regime attempted to make everyone complicit in its goals. We talked earlier about how they would very often take dissidents and put them in the insane asylum because it's crazy. How could you be against the country that you're in? That's just not normal. 
You, there must be something wrong with you. Um, while the KGB would complete secret acts, its existence was known, and many things that they did were done right out in the open. Military, police, militia were a fixture on the streets of the Soviet Union. In other words, and this is something that's actually changed a bit in the United States after 9-11, where you are starting to see more military, at least in certain cities, because of terrorism. Um, but it's not the everyday, every block of, of the city presence that you might have had in Moscow in the 80s. It wasn't unusual at all to see one someone in a military uniform among civilian life. And they were also, that extended into the political sphere, where it was totally normal to have a military and um, KGB representation in politics. Not just an influence on politics, but in politics. There's this refrain you're hearing in, you know, among uh, Trump supporters and Trump himself now about a deep state. That was something that was unquestioned in the Soviet Union. It didn't take long for Vladimir Putin, newly appointed as president after uh, Boris Yeltsin resigned on New Year's 2000. He meets with journalists and makes three demands of them. One, he wants them to stop anti-corruption investigations of former President Yeltsin's family. Two, to stop criticism of the Chechen war that was going on then. But three, to remove the puppet portraying Putin on uh, Shenderovic's satirical TV show, Kukli Puppets. This is an extremely popular puppet TV show on for five years mocking politicians. The character meant to be Putin was an ugly dwarf who had magic powers over people. What should one do? when faced with a bald-faced lie over and over again. This is what Shandarovic said. The most silent protest is to get up and leave. And indeed, he wanted to do that here in this meeting. Maybe we should have done that, but nobody dared. He was a president after all. Many turned against journalists as the government did. In 2006, the most famous independent investigative reporter in Russia, Anna Politkovskaya, was murdered. With TV and newspaper industry under control of Putin's government, oligarchs now turned to the internet. And there's a plan there too. Already in the 2000s, the Kremlin had created these pro-Kremlin youth organizations. Nashi, ours, was the oldest movement, uh, built up under the direct guidance of uh, one of uh, Putin's lieutenants and Moladaya Gavardia, the young guard. But another component was added to this in May 2009. A Kremlin school of bloggers was launched. 80 people. In uh, 2009, then-President Medvedev visited Singapore and was widely quoted that he was eager to follow the authoritarian leader's role, Lee Kuan Yew. The Arab Spring was going on in 2011 in Tunisia, Egypt, and this made the Russians' government, uh, the Russian government, uncomfortable. There were suggestions that the Arab Spring was an American conspiracy. We know that's laughable in the United States, because we don't feel we had control over a lot of what went on in uh, Libya or Egypt, but they felt that strongly. The U.S. was attempting to overthrow the Russian regime. Still, many people felt that maybe Medvedev was kind of a Putin light. Maybe a uh, Bill Gates, new Russia coming, but in, in reality, it's a it's a government of one, and then much the same. And in 2000, it was easily switched over between the two, and Putin elected to run for president. Now, in December 2011, in the Financial Times, Konstantin Goloskakov. The commissar of the pro-Kremlin Nashi youth movement, we talked about a minute ago, admitted that there was a launch of cyber talks 
on Estonia in 2007. Estonia decided to move a Soviet war memorial, and this was the, quote, punishment. Youth movements were also encouraged by the Kremlin to hack. The head of a Russian version of Facebook, Vikantok, Not as popular as Facebook itself, because Facebook has international users, but it's a within Russia one, was asked by the FSB to block nine different protest groups. Durov, the head, didn't comply and then was summoned to the St. Petersburg prosecutor's office. He didn't go. Your elbow is close, but you cannot bite it. So goes another proverb, and we know that one by it's not as easy as it seems. And understanding the situation is not easy. How do we understand such a system that's so foreign to us, a country like the Soviet Union, um, where some of the strongest repression was quiet repression, self-inflicted, fear of police, uh, fear of ostracism causing dishonor to your family, being the bad ones, unhelpful to the country, scorn of elders, even peers, the pointed finger, the distant laugh. The U.S. doesn't have the same mentality, though it came out of different times. You have little sayings, loose lips sink ships. If you see something, say something. You see signs like this now. But it's there's still something that there needs to be signs about because it's not ingrained in our culture. It was ingrained, it, it was tenets of Soviet life. Even in the 1970s or in the 80s, traveling around the USSR, you would be subject to requests. Where are your documents? It's not just like a driver's license if you're driving. It's anywhere. Where's your spotkas, your papers? For travel, entry into a factory, for staying in a hotel, uh, ubiquitous layers of people who would ask for them. KGB, yes, but there were other agents, state police, militia, Moscow police, you really needed those papers to get anywhere in Moscow. Every factory had what we might call an HR department, but they were called a first department. A resume provided a not by you. The first department would have a resume on you, about you. It's your employer's resume of you. It was HR and steroids. Kept a watch on employees, full dossier, all your strengths, all your weaknesses, all your activities. And... They devoted labor resources to this task. You see, in the absence of computers, you're seeing them devote resources to this task. For a new job, travel, for promotion, a full characteristica must be obtained from your first department. The first department was on any enterprise handling censorship and occasional tips about your behavior. So acting up at work did not mean just getting fired, perhaps. In fact, in the Soviet Union, there was 100% on employment and firing wasn't rare. Demotion might be. It could impact your life. It could have you flagged. A man whose son insisted on wearing a mohawk at school in the early 80s was ridiculed, punched by fellow workers in his factory, and cut off from promotions at work. Take out the communism and the totalitarian factor. Russia in the Soviet times, another way to understand it, we talked about it being a very militarized country in a way that, you know, if you're not living on a military base, you may not understand. It was also a very formal country. Think an older United States. Formal country, even in the 70s and 80s. Polite, conservative. Men wore hats long after they were abandoned by men in the United States. Restaurants had coat rooms because you wore coats. People were regulated in their behavior. Older babushkas were the omnipresent grandmother of the USSR, would have no problem correcting the behavior of a younger woman in public or loudly criticizing her dress with everyone hearing if her dress was too informal. It didn't matter if the babushka had no relationship to the woman. Then there was the more complex repression, not the obvious whip and lash, but the broken cog 
the bottlenecks, which slowed the individual down. It just, there is so much bureaucracy that embarking on any individual project was difficult just by its nature. It reduced freedom in a quiet way. The poor leadership, the laziness, the corruption, the who do you think you are. 99% of all the suppression in the USSR wasn't because some guy wanted to speak out against communism for the hell of it, but because there were complaints that because of the poor planning, there was no food for families, or things weren't working right. Here's what a Soviet citizen said to a New York Times reporter. You talk as if tyranny is the only problem, but for most of us, what happens in the KGB headquarters is not the problem. What really upsets us is that things don't work anymore. You know, stop writing in the American press about the KGB and write about why I can't get a baby bottle, which in the 1980s was one of those dream type items, hard to get. You could not just take road trips, you know, we're used to like, hey, let's get in the car and travel across the U.S. You could not just take road trips in the Soviet Union. There were many places that were closed, simply closed, uh, military cities. But in these military cities, scientists and civilians lived. We talked about the control that Soviet Union had on communications on so many areas, but communications being one. We talked about SORM-3, which covered all of the telecommunications. One ramification of SORM-3 feeds compromise. Russian journalists report that the FSB is harvesting raw material, intercepts from phone calls and emails to manufacture compromise. So not only can they listen and not only do they get everything, all conversations, but they can also change and edit to put people in a compromising position. Bultnaya Square is on an island. The Moscow River runs on one side and a small canal on the other. The Kremlin is located across the river. On Saturday, December 10th, more than 50,000 people crowded onto that island, and nothing so large had ever been seen in Moscow since the dying days of the Soviet Union. Signs read, Putin must go. You do not represent us. Things like this. For many Russians, this is the first time they'd ever protested in their lives. Uh, many Russians who were not particularly interested in elections before became increasingly interested and were angry about it. The reason behind the protest ostensibly is the sitting president, Medvedev, and Vladimir Putin agreed on a deal where Putin would run for president again after having served two terms. As a member of the Russian Duma said, Boris Nemstov, the Russian people were just told it would be among these two, Dulce or Gabbana. And they thought it would be like that, period. Here's what the Red Web, I'll read from a short section here. Those who could not make it watched it live on TV Dozen, Rain, TV Rain, which you know uh, I interviewed Mikhail Zygar from that TV network last year. The protesters were the heart of the new Russian middle class, people who usually were found in the restaurants and cafes of Moscow, but were now on the island with placards and slogans. The crowd was also sprinkled with the usual assortments of radical anarchists, journalists, and human rights campaigners who had attended demonstrations and marches over the year. But this time they were swallowed up in the mass of completely new faces, most of whom were attending a protest for the first time. The protest on Bolognaya Square marked something completely new. It was not political parties, it wasn't trade unions or charismatic leaders that drove Muscovites to demonstrate by the tens of thousands. Those who went to Bulatnaya were not ready to support any political group or party. The crowd responded enthusiastically to, proper, to popular thriller writer Boris Akunin, who in a speech called not only for the restitution of Muscovite's right to elect their mayor, but also for a rerun of the election in the capital. They were galvanized by anger over the election fraud which had been exposed by new technologies on the web. And they were mobilized through social networks in a country that was for centuries defined by hierarchical, 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 
hierarchical order, by a power vertical, it was remarkable to see citizens united so thoroughly by horizontal methods. The protesters had also enthusiastically embraced a new symbol, the white ribbon. It was originally proposed by a user on LiveJournal, Russia's top blogging platform, and it went viral, with thousands taking it up. White ribbons appeared on user pics, on user blogs, and social media. And soon people took the white ribbon offline and began displaying them on their cars too. Younger protesters that were so digitally connected that they broadcast the event live by holding iPads over their heads said it was a day that a group that had been silent had been heard. The authorities tried to discourage attendance, saying that widespread protests could prove as destabilizing as the Soviet collapse, which occurred 20 years ago from the month of the protest. And that wasn't lost on anyone. Putin said that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had set off the wave of activism by publicly criticizing the conduct of the parliamentary elections. She set the tone for some actors in our country and gave them a signal, Mr. Putin said, according to a New York Times story. They heard the signal and with the support of the U.S. State Department began their active work. Protesters, however, laughed at this notion. One speaker asked the crowd, are we here because Hillary Clinton texted us? And the crowd laughed. Uh, Sergei Zidkov, a 50-year-old who identified himself as a Russian nationalist, gave an expectant smile in a conversation with an American. I'd like to know when we are going to get your money. December 15th of the year, Putin makes, attends an annual TV call-in show. And three Russian TV channels air it, as well as three major Russian radio stations. And Putin is repeatedly asked about the protest. The show goes on for hours. At one point, uh, the editor-chief of the popular Echo Mosky said, You were replying to the opposition, but what could you tell to those newly outraged people? Angry at the unfairness. They believe their voices got stolen. Putin was at a loss to explain this. He said that according to his information, the protesters were students who had been paid to attend and then blamed the West for sending them. It is uh, perhaps somewhat interesting to note that we have in our Constitution, you'll be familiar, the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble. And it may not be clear or may not be known that the Soviet Constitution also had some explanations of rights, freedom of the speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of artistic work, protection of family, inviolability of the person and home, right to privacy. This is uh, in the Soviet Constitution and in the Russian Constitution, uh, Article 29, everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought and speech and the freedom of the mass media shall be guaranteed. Censorship shall be prohibited. This is in the Russian Constitution. Was it followed? Well... Despite the protests in 2011, the 2012 election works out well for Vladimir Putin. There was no significant opposition leader. He indeed is popular in many parts of Russia, particularly the area outside of Moscow. Um, the very next morning, March 5th, there was a cyber attack. Semantic and an internet security firm identified a surge of spam emails, widely disseminated. Messages seemed to be promoting a rally against Putin, but they were also calorying. Um, messages seemed to be promoting this rally that was to be held against Putin, but they were also carrying, according to Semantic, malware disguised as an attachment. So if you open up that attachment, a Trojan hidden piece of software would overwrite files, destroy files, and then eventually crash a computer. Obviously, the intention here is to destroy credibility of these protesting organizations, but people would be so mad that their computer was crashed. The attack failed because most people did not open this attachment. They knew that uh, plans would be on Facebook not from an email, you know, it's 2012, come on. 
Um, <laughs> you know, Putin's come a long way in his understanding of the internet since we last talked to, about this, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, come on, get with the time. So there wasn't enough to, to make it viral. Also in 2012, there's a meeting between the presidential administration and e-leaders, um, people from Yandex, a big news site, people from Google Russia, they are basically dictated to, and there is going to be filtering on these websites is what's announced. It didn't take long for internet companies to accept a censored internet in Russia. The internet companies were passive, similar to the time at the beginning with the introduction of SORM. DPI technology came about in mid 2000s. This is deep packet inspection outside filters on internet traffic and gives an insider gives an outsider a way to penetrate into content to conduct surveillance eric king head of research at privacy international leading british ngo said that dpi allows the state to peer into everyone's internet traffic and read copy or even modify emails the day-to-day -day filtering and censorship of the internet was done by a department called Roskomnadzor. Or the Roskomnadzor agency selected what should be censored, and it fell to ISPs and telecom operators to implement those blacklists. So they would say, get rid of this page, and people like Twitter and Facebook in Russia were absolutely doing it. They also ordered that uh, in 2015 the state Duma passes a law using a, a, a fig leaf excuse of uh, that they're protecting against uh, child uh, exploitation. They passed a law prohibiting the storage of Russians' personal data anywhere but in Russia. Global platforms would have to relocate their service to Russia by September 1st, 2015. And they've done it. There was a recent large protest in 2018 and police detained more than 800 people across Russia during protests against government plans to raise the national retirement age. In Moscow, protesters gathered on the city's Pushkin Square. About 2,500 people ignored police warnings to disperse. They chanted, Putin is a thief, and no increase in the pension age. The largest number of arrests were in St. Petersburg where 354 people were detained, according to OVD Info, a website that tracks politics-related arrests. It's important to understand this, uh, what's going on. I mean, Russia is an, an important country in the world, an actor on the world stage. You know, it's a country that has demonstrated a desire to interfere with our political process. Um, it's not necessary for you to believe that, uh, you know, oh, Donald Trump only won because of uh, Russia or something like that in order to be concerned about this and in order to want to seek out more information. And as with anything, I think that a look at the history is important. If we're going to divine motives, for instance, we have to see what someone is capable of and what they desire. And history can illuminate that as, as well as anything. Website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Um, we have an offer there for the premium. It can be as little as $2 a month. You can get more content. And I do thank you for listening. <laughs>